There's a new trend that is seeping into the board game crowdfunding space more and more, and that is the $1 pre-order. If you follow some prominent creators in this space like Alex at Board Game Co, Chris at Leisure of Games, and equally Chris at Room and Board, if you're in some of the prominent Facebook or other online communities for board gaming, it's highly likely you are already aware of this trend and the strong feeling out there among some in the community that this trend is predatory, it's harmful, and that the motive behind it is morally wrong. I don't think that that is the case, and instead think that this is a product of a much larger issue that exists within the modern crowdfunding space. But I want to take time today to do my best to fully unpack not only the situation, but equally the reasoning from my stance on it. I'm aware that this is a tender topic. I've debated making this video for really a couple of weeks solely because I've been worried that not necessarily having the same stance as other creators could lead to me getting the same treatment as the company that is pushing this trend. But I believe that our community and the creators in our community are better than that. We need to trust that we can have these robust discussions. And so here we are. I equally wanted to take the time to research this topic properly to get more information so that I can help you feel a bit more informed, which is what this channel is all about. To give some context right at the start on what this new trend is, the $1 pre-order or pre-pledge is a trend where you are incentivized to give a creator $1 before a campaign begins in return for a reward at a discount. Incentivizing action is not a new thing in our space. Most recently, GameFound introduced follower gifts where following a campaign could get you a free miniature, a free card expansion or some other token item in return for you taking that action. But historic examples exist too on platforms like Kickstarter. Heading to a landing page and signing up for a mailing list may get you a reward like exclusive cards. The thing that sets this new trend apart is that instead of handing over your email address, you're being asked to hand over a dollar. And the introduction of money into this ecosystem has drastically shifted the acceptance and perception of this practice. The company that is being held responsible for bringing this strategy into the board gaming space is Launchboom. Launchboom are a marketing agency that specializes in the crowdfunding space. They were founded in 2013. Uh, historically, they've worked with a wide variety of projects uh, and project types like tech, lifestyle products, bicycles and more, but increasingly they've been working with creators in the tabletop space to help market their products to a wider audience. Because Launchboom have existed primarily outside of the board game space, their introduction to this ecosystem has been that of a disruptive force. They've been introducing new methods and ways of doing things that are perceived as being okay and that work in other niches into the tabletop space. In doing so, what we're seeing is a tension. Whether we agree with it or not, between what has been seen as the status quo being challenged and a new normal attempting to be formed. And before we dive into the reaction and the responses to all of this, it's important to note that the methods that Launchboom are using are not new. They haven't been pioneered by Launchboom and they have existed in the board game space now for almost two years, but they're only beginning to be picked up and covered by creators and the community now. And what I equally want to show you through the research that I've done is that they aren't the only ones doing this, nor is what they're doing the most egregious examples of it. But equally, before we dive into the nitty gritty, I want to state two things that should be among the key takeaways that you take from this video. First of all, I'm going to be referencing content made by other creators in this video. I'm going to be quoting them, and I want to be incredibly clear that I'm quoting them for clarity, not because I think they're fundamentally wrong or because I want to start arguments for YouTube drama clicks. I'm humbled and honored that I get to share the same virtual spaces as the creators I'm quoting in this video, and I believe that their voices are valid and incredibly important. So please don't see this as an excuse to bash them in the comments or do anything like that. I'm not here for that. I don't believe in that. If that's your jam, go suck a lemon because I'm going to be deleting your comments. Secondly, I think that the treatment that Launchboom and their team have received from us as a community in all of this has not been one of our best moments as a community. I think there's a lot of villainization that's going on here, and I think that some of the statements that are being said fail to recognize that the people at Launchboom are real people too. We can disagree with their practices, we can disagree on methods, but we can still treat one another respectfully and with civility. 
One of the poster child campaigns and one of the most talked about earliest examples of the $1 pre-pledge was the board game Botany, which is actually fulfilling as I'm making this video. Botany was funded on Kickstarter on June 1st of 2023 and raised just over $1 million. It was Amy and Dustin's first Kickstarter project. They're the, the husband and wife, I believe they are husband and wife couple behind the project. And they partnered with Launchboom in December of 2022 as their marketing partners. Amy and Dustin took Launchboom's advice and created a $1 reservation funnel. So where some Facebook ads for crowdfunding campaigns would take you to an email sign up or to the pre-launch page to sign up for launch, Botany's funnel took you to a landing page where you could see more information about the game, similar to landing pages we would see for other games. You could then sign up for their mailing list to be notified when the campaign was live and receive marketing materials. And then once you had signed up for the mailing list, you would be presented with a page where you could get an offer to pay $1 for a bonus mini expansion, which in Botany's case was the Brilliant Blue Botanicals expansion, which is a real tongue twister to try and say in my accent. Thanks. Here is the information that was presented to people who got to that page. It didn't state what the cost of the mini expansion was outside of the offer. It did clearly state what the pledge price would be for Botany on Kickstarter, and they equally shared what the retail price for Botany would be post campaign. It's equally important to remember because it, it does get brought up in this conversation that um, one of the downsides of the $1 pre pledge is that there isn't enough information on the game, there's just this offer. With the example of Botany, You've already got to the landing page, which explains all about gameplay, all the info in the game, and you only get served this $1 pre-offer once you've, I, I assume, went through all of that information, hopefully read it, and then signed up for their mailing list. But why do this when up to this point, most campaigns just ask us to hit the follow campaign button or to sign up for a mailing list? What impact will this really have? Surely it couldn't just be to try and earn a pile of money through $1 pre-orders. And these are great questions because you're right, it's not done for monetary gain or at least not at this part of the funnel. It's done as part of a sales technique that has been coined in more modern times as the foot in the door technique. It got its name in the era of the door to door salesman where if a salesman got their foot into your door, you couldn't shut the door. Now that sounds incredibly manipulative and forceful, and you would be right in thinking that. But the key principle of this technique is that if I ask you for something small and you give it to me, you're gonna be much more likely to respond positively when I ask for something bigger next time. It's important to realize that this technique is not inherently unethical, but its implementation can be, and that is an important distinction to remember as we go forward. Examples of this foot in the door technique can be a political candidate asking you to attend a rally. If you show up, perhaps they then ask you to do some grassroots campaigning for them, or they may even ask you for a donation for their campaign. If you have a local food bank in your area and they are asking for people to donate one item as part of a food drive, when you show up with that item, they may ask if you'd be willing to volunteer. Here's how Forbes break down this technique. First, determine what an appropriate small request is. This small request should be something that a large percentage of your visitors are capable of doing. In this case, the assumption is that most people would have access to $1 in expendable income, and equally that they are possibly willing to do. For example, most people have email addresses. People are accustomed to giving up their email addresses and may be willing to do so. Other examples are clicking a link, downloading a product, completing a survey, starting a trial membership, or sharing on social media, which are all examples of small requests, and some of which may already feel familiar. Second, create a way to pitch your second large request. If you have their email address or contact information, this shouldn't be hard, according to Forbes. Keep in mind that you can make your second request immediately after the first request. You don't have to wait for any amount of time to elapse. The next page after the first request can feature the second request. Third, make your big request. Usually your big request is more conversion focused. You can ask for the seal, for the software download, for the credit card information, or some other major move. With that in mind, we can see how Botany has used the foot in the door technique at least twice. First of all, the small request is to click the link to their ad for more information on the game. The second request or the large request is to give them your email. Now, this is where most crowdfunding campaigns would end in their marketing. 
Instead, Botany went to the third and largest ask, which was to give them a dollar. If we zoom out, this then plays into a larger funnel where step one was to click the link, step two was to give the dollar, step three was to pledge for the game. And again, let's remember, if you see a crowdfunding campaign ad that sends you to a landing page, an email sign up, or to the Kickstarter page to hit the follow button, they are using the exact same technique. Please make no mistake about this. The introduction of the foot in the door technique was not introduced to this space by launch boom. It's existed ever since creators started using ads and mailing list signups and landing pages and the follow gift on GameFound and the early bird discount or reward on other platforms. This practice is not new and it's naive to think otherwise. Launchboom simply introduced the $1 aspect to this niche. But why introduce this new monetary aspect? Well, historically, when the foot in the door funnel looks like click the link and then give me your email, the standard conversion rate of people who did that to people who then purchased the product would have been about anywhere between one to 10%. Therefore, if you got a thousand people on your mailing list through your ad campaign, it would be standard or typical for 10 people on that list to purchase your game. So does LaunchBoom's funnel actually work and does it convert better? For Botany, yes. You've got a bunch of people. Um, they use a one dollar reservation system, so we, you know, we had a mini expansion that people could buy for a dollar, which which mm -hmm. increases their um, conversion rate. So, like an average email converts about one, you know, sign up converts about one percent to three percent. Uh, the uh, the one dollar mini expansion that we sold converted at forty eight percent by comparison mm -hmm. um, off the twenty six hundred VIPs that we had signed up for the campaign um, within the first twenty four hours. But yeah, so I mean, like of our, you know, of our twenty six hundred, just the one dollar reservations that we did through Launch Boom. Um, mm -hmm. The we had a, we had almost thirteen hundred of those convert uh, at an average order value of seventy each. I mean, you know that you're, you're looking at. Um, yeah. I'm doing math on live now, but it's like ninety two thousand dollars, right? Ish. Um, and yep. so and high average order volume too. That's another factor. The more we talk about, it, the more that I see there's just a lot of things going on there. <laughs> but perhaps Botany is an outlier. Maybe this hasn't worked for others, and they're simply skewing the data. Nope. Kelp by Wonder Boy Games has also used the $1 pre-order as part of their pre-marketing. They sold approximately 1,950 mini expansions and saw a conversion rate of 54% of people who bought the mini expansion and went on to pledge for the full game. Alpha Clash, the trading card game which actually launched on Kickstarter before Botany, used the same technique. They secured just over a thousand VIPs, which is what they're called by launch boom, i.e. the people who purchased the pre-order. Now, I couldn't find conversion rate stats for that project, but it doesn't stop there. Nitro Press sold 1,122 $1 reservations, which drove almost 95,000 pounds in revenue to their campaign. Other examples that aren't in our space, Nomad's Pad sold 916 $50 reservations, which converted to over $350,000 in revenue on their campaign. Zion Cyber X, which were a bike manufacturer, sold over 1,200 reservations for their bike campaign, with reservations ranging in price from $1 to $100. And before you ask, because I know you're gonna, most people bought the $100 reservation. And again, just to fully clarify, the foot in the door technique is not new in this space. This tactic of emotionally attaching you to the product isn't new. It's just become more brazen over time. It used to be that you were attached because you gave them their email and got the email to say that the campaign was launched. It was once hitting the follow button and getting notified that a campaign was live. It's the whole, you followed this campaign, so why not back it? Or getting the emails in the last 48 hours from Kickstarter that state, hey, time's running out to back this campaign. Insinuating that, well, you followed this campaign, you showed intent to support it, why haven't you supported it yet? All the way up to GameFound incentivizing the pledge with free gifts, which increased conversion rate from following for a gift to backing the product, having a conversion rate of approximately 24%. Because at the end of the day, you'll get a free gift for this that others won't get. So you might as well back it, otherwise you'll lose that free gift. With this $1 reservation funnel seeming to work and work well in enabling creators to raise more revenue and case studies that prove that, it was only a matter of time before more and more creators started looking to implement it. 
February of 2023, we started to see content creators online begin to take notice that this trend, or new implementation, should we say, of this trend, was becoming more widespread. Liege of Games was the first creator that I saw make a video on the topic, with Alex over at Board Game Co. following up uh, with a video shortly after, uh, with both creators disagreeing with the introduction of the $1 pre-order. But why? One of the terms that I saw coming up in discussions about this in our community is that the $1 pre-order is a FOMO tactic, and FOMO is wrong, but yet we've accepted fear of missing out practices at other times with Kickstarter exclusives, early bird pledges, and others. The very nature of crowdfunding comes with an inherent feeling of fear of missing out. A game that chooses not to come to retail is FOMO. They're creating a false scarcity only to, in some cases, run another campaign in a couple of years for a reprint. Godo Games did exactly this with Among Cultists, where they ran a campaign initially in January 2023, and then ran a reprint campaign a year later in January of 2024, just over a month after fulfillment completed on the first one. So why take greater issue with this than previous tactics? Because it's not a Kickstarter problem, to be clear. There are companies that have done this on GameFound. It is not a GameFound-enabled system, but there are companies who have run campaigns on GameFound and done this. There have been companies who have run the campaigns on Kickstarter and done this. But a parallel you'd find on something like GameFound is the follower reward. GameFound has a follower reward where if you follow the campaign, boom, you locked in a $5 discount on something or some miniature or promo, whatever it is. And that has the same degree of the emotional hook. It does. Personally, and again, we'll get to the apology second, personally, I'm okay with that because they're not asking you to give up money. They're asking you to click follow. There's no real loss at all. Your emotional investment is lower and you're not giving up any money at all. So they are, that is 100% is a sales tactic. 100% it is still the tactic of, hey, boom, you've locked in that follower award. You now have that extra. And now you've, and we've incentivized you to sign up for an email to get the thing. I think Alex does a great job at differentiating why some in the community are in such vocal opposition to this tactic. It's the introduction of money. I wholeheartedly agree with this, and I see it as being a very dangerous precedent, which I alluded to at the start as part of a bigger issue, which we will talk about in a second. But one of the other reasons that Alex says he hates this is actually because of the justification that's been given by some of the people who are implementing it. Alex states that what he's been told by some or suggested by some is that this is to give value to the backer or to the customer. And while I would say that that's not wrong, it's not fully right either, and it's a bit of a half-truth answer. Because yes, of course you want the customer to feel like they're getting value, they wouldn't give you the dollar if they didn't. But the real reason you're doing this is data. In the earlier days of crowdfunding and the internet in general, we relied heavily on organic reach. What I mean by that is that if I launched a campaign, I relied primarily on who was in my circles, my family, my friends, and then whoever would naturally come across the campaign organically. As the internet has developed and crowdfunding has developed, we've seen more and more creators adopt traditional marketing tools to spread the word about their campaign. In essence, paid advertising. Now, the early days of online advertising were very similar to the early days of advertising in general. You pump a ton of money into it and you hope that it gets to the right people and those people choose to buy the thing. As time has gone on, we've developed new tools to better track how we as consumers interact with advertising. And one of the key examples for this that most creators are using at the moment is the Pixel. One of the primary places that creators will pay for advertising is on the Meta suite of platforms. And Meta have a tool called the Pixel that is through cookies and other trackable metrics that I'm not as knowledgeable about. It's able to track your usage of content on the internet. So for example, if I wanna pay for an ad to drive people towards my Kickstarter pre-launch page, I can set up that ad on Facebook, get a Pixel for that ad data set, and install that Pixel on my Kickstarter campaign. This will then send data to Meta about how many people click the ad, how many of those people click the follow button on Kickstarter, and then it will use that data to refine who sees the ad in order to maximize my ad spend for most conversions because it will begin to understand what kind of person is more likely to hit the follow button based on the data that it's collecting in real time. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but this is incredibly important to understand what's going on here. And if you're a smart cookie, which I believe you are, you might have caught on to how beneficial the $1 pre-order system could be in this ecosystem. 
You see, we've talked about conversion rates for email marketing, free gifts, things like that already. And up to this point, if you're a creator and you're about to spend money on advertising and you want to maximize your return on that ad spend, basically just get more people to, to back the product so you can earn that money back, then you want to advertise to people who are most likely to like what you're doing and give you money. So if I use something like the $1 pre-order and I get my pixel or my ads to gather data on the types of people who are clicking through the ad and giving me that dollar, then my ads will be more likely to find people who will pledge to my campaign and in essence give me money when the campaign launches. And it will have a higher chance of earning me money based on the stats we've talked about compared to other conventional ways of doing this like gathering emails, like pushing for campaign follows. This is truly what this is all about. Using a technique that enables creators to find the people who are most likely to give them money in the long term, and equally so that they can spend their ad budget on finding those people as opposed to just casting a wide net and hoping for the best. There's also the conversation, this is a side tangent, like you're essentially selling your data, right? But I, I'm not one of those people who <laughs> even takes offense to that because I just assume that all of our data is being sold already. I feel like if you live in the internet age and you don't assume that all of your data is being sold, nah, you're just buying, you're spending $1 to allow a marketing <laughs> company to use your data so you know where it's going. But it, it'll probably be used anyway. Absolutely. But again, this isn't new. If you've ever clicked an ad on Facebook or a website banner on BoardGameGeek or the follow button on Kickstarter or anything like that, then you've fed an algorithm with information about you and your purchasing and interest habits. You've provided information about yourself to marketing companies, to large corporations like Meta and to the companies making these games, which they will use in order to reach more people like you and like me who they think will also like their product and want to buy it. This isn't you. It's simply, as Chris says here, that you're giving them a dollar for the privilege. A simplified distillation of the transaction that's going on here is the company is, is basically saying, hey, give me your information on what kind of person you are, and in return, I'll sell you this thing for a discount that I think you'll like. In those older days of advertising, think Mad Men era all the way up to the 90s and arguably the early 2000s, the goal of advertising was to bombard us. If I pump enough money into this machine and pay for more ads, more TV time, more spots in your newspapers and magazine, a big, a big enough Super Bowl spot, then you'll buy my product. If I can disrupt your life enough, you will buy what I'm selling. Over time, quite rightly, we as a society became tired of this way of being marketed to, and we saw an increase in what was called inbound marketing or permission-based marketing. Permission-based marketing attempted to move the space from here's my thing and you'll hear about it whether you like it or not to the opt-in. Permission-based marketing operates from a place of, hey, I've made this thing. I think you'll like it. I don't want to bombard you. So if you want to hear more about it, then sign up for our mailing list and take this action in whatever sense that presents itself. Now, from what I can tell, this discussion seems to be fundamentally about morality and marketing ethics. Basically, what is right or wrong within marketing and why? And I think that way because critics are using language like predatory marketing tactic or emotional manipulation or going so far as to say they will never back a campaign from a creator that uses this strategy. All of this, to me, signals an ethical conversation. Now, Alex did say that he doesn't think it's inherently ethically wrong. There is no lie going on. But the choice to use the word manipulation is questioning the ethics of the strategy, in my opinion, because manipulation has a very negative connotation. And I believe most people would define it as using dishonest means to influence someone for your own personal gain. So ultimately, this asks the question, is the $1 reservation strategy ethical or not? The word manipulation has come up a lot in the conversations online around this $1 pre-order topic. And I think it's somewhat naive of us to say, well, I don't like this $1 pre-order because it's manipulation in order to get me to buy. As if we haven't been manipulated our entire lives. Why do, you, why do we buy anything? Why do we buy a certain brand over another? But equally, I think when we frame it like this, we can be heard to be saying that our choice in any of this is removed. At the end of the day, we do choose to sign up to that mailing list, to get that free follow gift, to hand over the $1. Yes, there are tactics that are used to encourage that behavior, but at the end of the day, I believe that we always have a choice. And I would argue that the $1 pre-order 
is a form of permission-based selling, where we, as the consumers, hand over the dollar because we believe that the value we receive outweighs the cost. Even if the information we're provided may be light in the ground, that is still the choice we're making. As a sidebar, if you'll let me soapbox for a minute, if the $1 pre-order is manipulation, then it is also manipulation when we say that this tactic is just another in the lines of marketing strategy trying to separate you from your hard-earned money. Because statements like that, whether we're aware of it or not, attempt to frame us or the person who says it as someone who's on your side who has your back in order to gain your trust so that what they say or what we say will carry more weight. If you agree with that, then comment down below. And that right there, that's a foot in the door technique. You don't have to comment, by the way, but if you comment, you've taken the small step. Then in a month, when I launch a Patreon, I'll say that you should support me so that I can continue to speak out against these people who are trying to separate you from your hard-earned money. All the while, while I'm separating you from your hard-earned money. Or I could say something like, hey, you should be supportive of the $1 reservation because it means that indie creators are able to earn more and that means more jobs. And that's a really good thing. You, you believe in people being able to support their families, right? Is what they're saying in both of these cases wrong? I don't think so, but in both cases, there are examples of manipulation. But at all times, we always have a choice. We have a choice of saying, actually, no, this isn't for me. But I appreciate that in the face of some of these tactics, some of us have an easier time saying no than others. And that is a valid concern. Three weeks ago from the time that I'm making this video, LaunchBoom responded by putting out their own video defending and explaining their position in this conversation. I actually think Mark, who you've already seen uh, being quoted here, does a good job on putting forward their side of things and attempting to tackle some of the objections that the community has had in a balanced manner. But there are two points that Mark raises that I think are either per examples of what he's trying to communicate or just completely wrong. Sorry, Mark. We'll start with the per example first. Uh, Mark asks the question in the launch boom response that, is it possible that people put down $1 because they actually want that thing? Now, Chris at Room and Board correctly picked up on this, per example, and this is what he said. Where he goes on to ask the question of how do you not know, why are we not asking the question, what about the people who want this expansion to begin with? What about the people who were, were excited about the game and were giving them additional value? And then juxtaposes that with the reason why this one campaign raised $4 million, this RPG campaign, is because they had 11,000 people sign up for that $1 pre-pledge reservation that got them a mini expansion. They were first-time creators. Look at the success that they've had. And so I, I, think, I think both of those statements being held alongside each other is a bit silly. Either they're already fans that would have purchased anyway, which means that your conversion numbers of it being 30 times more likely, it just means the people who are already going to purchase, purchased. People who are going to spend money, spent money. And so then you can point to that as like a monumental success because the people who were going to spend money spent the money, which I'm only bringing up because it was brought up in the video, but I guess it's excused because those $1 people were going to spend the money anyway, right? I think Legends of Avantris is, is a really bad example to use because framing them as first-time creators, while technically correct, lacks the full context. They're first-time Kickstarter creators, but they have 629,000 subscribers on YouTube, 193,000 on Instagram, over half a million on TikTok, and Quiz, Quiz? And Chris, quite rightly, I believe, is communicating that it's highly likely that some within that community would have gone for the $1 pre-order because they want to support the creators. And that's if, by the way, the $1 pre-order was shared with them or whether that pre-order was solely reserved for the paid ads, which I'm sure some of their core audience would have been, in, would have been served anyway. I think botany should be the example they're using because as far as I'm aware, they were first time creators with no or little following when they launched. Now, here's the part where I think Mark is wrong. Sorry, Mark. Which brings me to the clickbait analogy where Alex compares the $1 reservation to clickbait. Now he does say that is not the perfect analogy, but it's been brought up in both videos now. And I think it's a really poor comparison to make. 
Clickbait is where you attract attention to your content by saying one thing and then you don't deliver on that thing that you said. It's essentially a broken promise. And because it's a broken promise, it may work in the short term, but it alienates your audience over the long term. If the $1 reservation strategy was to promise backers a discounted add-on and then not give them that discounted add-on, then I would agree with the analogy to clickbait. But backers are being promised a discounted add-on and then being given that discounted add-on. So there is no dishonesty going on between the creator and the backer. So clickbait uh, is the practice of drawing a viewer in using catching imagery, appealing or controversial titling and a whole plethora of other techniques, especially here on YouTube. When done correctly, this draws the viewer in through a proposition which you then deliver on in your content. For example, if my title was, you'll never believe what we did in the supermarket with my face looking you know, shocked and a big red circle around the supermarket, and then I show you in the video that I did something shocking, that is clickbait, but it's clickbait done right. You follow through on the promise. Arguably, most of the videos here on Should You Back It are clickbait. Uh, the most of you, there's a very common theme of the 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 thumbnail and the titles are always should you back whatever game it is, it's clickbait. But I am delivering on the clickbait by kind of telling you whether you should um, back it or not. But this video isn't about me. Well, let's talk. Uh, clickbait done incorrectly is when you don't deliver on the promise. And Mark rightly communicates that when you do this as a creator, it results in a breakdown of trust. So let's come into land and talk about why I'm okay with the $1 pre-order, but equally why I think it speaks to a larger issue and shows that launch boom are not the only people that are doing this in our space. I don't think that the $1 pre-order is morally wrong, but I think its implementation can be. And I think the negative response from the community speaks more to the wider issue we've seen with crowdfunding in recent years, and that is its gradual but determined shift from what crowdfunding was always meant to be. In the early days of crowdfunding, these platforms were made in order for a creator to step forward and say, hey, I have this idea, I have this thing, I don't have the money to make this, but if you give me the money, I can take the sellotape covered prototype and turn it into something cool. I have a dream, I think you'll like it, help me make it. And over time, we went from a platform where dreams were realized to a glorified pre-order store where companies who have the resources to bring their game to market are using it as a way to negate risk. And we've gotten there over time by having flashy stretch goals, by having early bird pledges, Kickstarter exclusives, by subsidizing shipping prices and putting that added cost into the pledge price so you think that shipping is actually cheaper than it is, but it really isn't. I believe that all of these things were done with the greatest of intentions. I choose to believe that. But it's led us to this place where now creators are trying to find more and more and new ways to have the biggest day one, to fund in milliseconds, and where crowdfunding has turned into the new retail experience. And we see this tension all the time, especially with refunds. In normal retail, we have legal rights to refunds. We have statutory rights here in the UK, and I don't believe that's just a UK thing. And when crowdfunding has the perception of retail, we assume that we have the same legal rights in that space as in retail, when in reality we don't. We assume we can get a refund when things go wrong or when you unfortunately have a mythic game situation, only to find out that we are not legally obligated to receive a refund. And this creates animosity and distrust in us and it's not the fault of crowdfunding, but it is the collective and shared fault of all of us, creators and consumers, for what we've allowed the crowdfunding space to become. My sense is that the backlash against the $1 pre-order, as Alex alluded to in his video, is not necessarily that we as a community feel like this is the worst thing to ever happen. Some may have that stance, but I think it's instead the line in the sand where we as a community are starting to realise hey, I think we're going too far here. And I agree with that sentiment. I think it's important that we step up as a community and we share what we feel as a line crossed so that creators and marketing companies can understand this space better and so we can all grow more healthily. Because Launchboom are not the only ones using this tactic. This is the latest project from Geek & Sun, the Megan Plus. I was intrigued by this project. I think their tales are fantastic. I see them at UK Games Expo every year and wish I could fit one in my suitcase and that I had enough money to 
purchase it to put it into my suitcase, but I got served an ad that led me to a pre-order page where the offer was to buy a 100 pound coupon that could be redeemed against the cost of the table, where I had nothing to lose, but everything to gain, even though this 100 pound coupon was non-refundable. But it could be converted to store credit, or it could be used in a future Kickstarter campaign or crowdfunding campaign, that by purchasing the 100 pound coupon, I could win a Megan table, but I had to also be an early bird backer of the campaign and place an early bird pledge in the first 72 hours of the campaign. I'm not trying to diss Geek and Son. I think they do make great tables. I genuinely would love to own one if they weren't charging an extortionate shipping price to get things shipped to Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland. That's something I have genuine issue with, but it's not the topic of this video. And it's more of a niche topic. I don't think many of you live in Northern Ireland. With Geek and Son and the Megan Plus campaign and with this whole pre-order thing, I'm, I'm choosing to believe that they're doing what they think is right and acceptable in order to support themselves and generate more revenue. I genuinely am choosing to believe that they're not trying to be predatory. And it's important for us as a community to also feed back to companies like Geek and Son, hey, maybe make this coupon be refundable. Maybe don't use language like nothing to lose, everything to gain, as opposed to us just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And before you try to blame Launchboom for the Geek and Sun campaign, the marketing team behind this one is Quest Hire, who have previously worked with Mythic Games and others on Hell, Darkest Dungeon, Six Siege, and who also go by the name Kick Agency. It's important we engage in these discussions. It's important that we feed back to creators and agencies what we feel is acceptable. But I think it's also important for creators and agencies to continue to try and find ways to innovate in this space and find new ways to get the word out there. Because as we're seeing with the Geek and Sun campaign, when people find new ways of doing things that work, it spreads. And it's up to us as the community to help set the boundaries for what is acceptable in these things. As always, though, this is just my recommendation, but hopefully you feel a bit more informed. I will do my best to respond to comments on this video, but this has been an exhausting video to make. So please give me grace if my responses aren't as in depth as this, or if it takes me a while to get back to you. In the meantime though, if you have found my content helpful, I'd love if I could stick my foot in your door and ask you to subscribe. <laughs> I'm a small channel trying to cover the games I think you're interested in, and your support really does help, even if my jokes aren't that great.